I kind of, yeah, so. That's what, the best education. You know, that's, <laughs> that's better than classroom, actually, is the, the actual, you're, you're absolutely right. So having worked with um, Han Mei, for example, gave me a, a very deep insight to writing for that, for the instrument. And um, I would even say it's always in the collaborative aspect. So for example, in um, the Native American songs, um, I had some work, I actually found a, two dramaturgs that I worked with, uh, one a, a theater-based choreographer and the other a, a theater director, um, friends and colleagues of mine, that I asked to, to coach me. Um, and so that I could better understand biomechanics and physical theater and projection of my voice. Um, and it was an immense uh, learning curve for me as well. I, I would hope that every composition is a venture into a new world and to learning. So for me, it's, it's the ability to keep learning and to expanding them. Yeah. Topics do come from very specific things. Uh, for example, the Native American um, song, th song fantasies. Um, that comes from a great interest in the culture and the, th the wisdom of, of Native American people, which exploded uh, four or five years ago when I found out that I actually have Native American uh, ancestry myself. I didn't know it. And it had obviously several generations ago been a secret in the family because that wasn't something that one would talk about actually. And the idea was to blend in and to lose that identity. And I rediscovered it as a genetic marker. Um, and that, that came as a great surprise to me. But it was also not a surprise because I always felt connected to Native American culture and, and wanted to know more about it. So these songs came to me um, through a book by Natalie Curtis. Natalie Curtis is the equivalent of a Bartok uh, in America. In the 1890s, she alone, um, incidentally, she was a student of um, Dvorak. Uh, and Busoni as well. Um, she traveled into the far west of America and throughout America and met with Native American chiefs usually. And because of the situation at the time that Native American culture was dying and it had been largely decimated by the um, powers that existed in, in Washington at the time, uh, it was an absolute massacre, a genocide. Um, she went to capture the songs and the stories of these peoples. And she was able to get permission from the chiefs because at that time they understood also that the cultures were, were disappearing. And that if they didn't do something, that the um, longevity, that would not be ensured of, of the songs and, and the cultures. So she had permission. And this is a massive book that is, uh, covers many nations and many tribes of Native American people. And she has, laboriously, she had transcribed songs and Native American languages. She has transcribed with translations um, and uh, with, with annotations and stories and background information. It's marvelous, absolutely marvelous. And um, that has, in my own musical life, trickled with various uh, inspirations based on that. But what came to me was this Native American um, song fantasy for piano, and it has had several incarnations. And the, the, the latest one has been to, and, and incidentally, I, I, when I premiered them in America, I had invited a Native American friend, and uh, she brought another friend, a Native American. And I asked her after the concert what she thought, and it, it was actually quite surprising to me. She said, she said it, miss, it was missing something. And I said, what, what do you mean? She couldn't put her finger on it. What, what was missing? Um, and I gave it a great deal of thought. And I decided that I think I got what was missing. These songs would happen. First of all, they're shamanistic. And, and I do see myself as shaman. Um, I think the artist can very well fill that role of shaman, modern shaman. And so that wasn't what I thought was missing. It was the, the connection to nature. And, and I realized that 
these songs would be performed in, in, in the prairies, in the valleys, in the mountainsides, and you would have the, the sounds of coyotes, you would have the sounds of birds, you would have the sounds of thunder, the sounds of wind rustling through the leaves of trees, you would have the sounds of babbling water. And I thought, how can I do that, short of pre, uh, recording? And I thought, that's very cheesy. I, I, I couldn't really do that. So I went into overtones, and I discovered that through overtones, um, I could actually create another world as, as a kind of metaphor of the supernatural world, uh, but also the natural world and supernatural world, the world of overtones. So, so there's a lot of working of overtones inside the piano that is sympathetically vibrating strings. And then I performed that, and that had a stronger reception, but I still felt something was missing. So I, I had to take the final step, which was to become the shaman fully and to chant. So the next performance, which premiered in, in um, Kathmandu, in Nepal, uh, late last year, uh, which I felt was very daring of me to, <laughs> to be chanting and, and, and telling stories, these Native American songs, to a largely Nepalese audience. Um, and um, to my excitement and encouragement, uh, it, it had a wonderful reception. And, and, I, and many people actually even compare that somewhat to Tibetan storytelling, even though, of course, it's musically and compositionally a different, different thing, but it has a spirituality to it. Um, and I felt I had found a point in, in common then. And, and, and an interesting, wonderful experience happened just after my trip to Nepal. Uh, I found out that a, a pianist, an American pianist, is, had record, is going, was going to, at that time, record them for a CD. And um, it's just amazing because she is Cherokee. She is a Native American. Oh, I see. So, so that, that, that is a, a validation. And, and somehow I think this is really important. It's very important for me uh, to make that inner connection with um, something very indigenous and ancient. The commission came from a marvelous player, Han Mei. And um, she's now based in Vancouver. So I first needed to know the instrument quite well. Um, and so I made two trips to Vancouver to spend time with her and to learn from her about her playing of the instrument. That's, that's not the same as learning something from a book. So, so I spent time with her. Um, and in that, I, I learned something of her life story and that, in fact, her father had been a general in the communist um, army. And her mother had even fought the Americans alongside the Koreans in the Korean War. And she was high up in the party herself as a player, a Chung player. And she, she did not like her life. She did not like the situation she was in. And she left a long time ago. She defected, if you wish, because this was at, uh, at a height of communist party strength and at a height of the, the non-communication going on between a Western world and a, and a communist world. Um, and this concert uh, was to be her return performance to China after so many years, several decades actually. Um, and so it was an extraordinary journey for her. So that inspired me and I wrote the concerto. It's, for me a concerto is always a relationship of an individual being the soloist, or individuals, and society. So the orchestra is a metaphor. It's all metaphor. <laughs> Music is metaphor. Everything is metaphor. Even we are metaphor. Um, so in this, she plays herself. It is a biographical concerto. And it goes through the <clears throat> struggle that, that she had in it. So that, that was something very specific.